All right. Well, I've got a message there. I need to get through this message. I just, I'm just like, I'm just so in awe of what God has been doing in uh, my life, and in, you know, I've been a Christian pretty my whole life. And you know, you go through seasons when you've been a Christian for 40 years. Uh, you know, you you kind of, you go through seasons of, you know, fresh revelation from God. You go through seasons of, uh, you go through seasons of turmoil and and um, discouragement. You go through mountaintop experiences and. You know, you lead people and you want to see them do well in life and sometimes they do and that's encouraging and sometimes they don't and that's heartbreaking. And I don't know, I just, I guess what I'm sharing with you is our church is that I'm just really encouraged by our season that we're in uh, as a church family here in Cessnock and in Scone. Uh, and, you know, I've always loved being a part of our church here at Beyond Church and God brought us, my wife and I and our family to this place to lead in this way and we really have for almost the entire time just pinched ourselves that we get to do what we do. And we're so grateful and we just love our church and we love you. And there really is, it's the, the great highlight of my life to be able to come into a room like this and just be able to enjoy not just the presence of God, but to be able to enjoy the presence of God with you. I mean, is there anything better than that? I mean, really, that's kind of as good as it gets. And so I just want to let you know that my heart is just really uh, full of joy and gr- so grateful that God is at work in this place. And if you found yourself here today, maybe it's your first time in church, well, I'm hoping and praying that you'll get in that sense as well, that there's something, there's something different about the house of God. That's what I'm really hoping and praying you kind of get out of this morning. So we are in a series as, as a church, going through a series called Feast on This Book, which is about reading the Bible uh, reading it faithfully, reading it regularly, reading it with others. And so we're going to really lean into that. We've got something, to, um, a little surprise for you all at the end of the service today. So don't leave early. Even if this isn't very good, you've got to stay until the end. It's like a YouTube clip. It's a hook. You can't leave until you watch right through to the end. So John 1, chapter 1, John chapter 1, verse 1 to 5. My, uh, the title of my message this morning is this, three critical considerations. You'll need to know this for later. Three critical considerations before eating a Bible. Now, you'll need to know that for later. So just put that in your back pocket. So this is the verse we're starting with. John chapter 1, verse 1 to 5 says this. It's entitled in my Bible, New Living Translation. It's entitled, Christ the Eternal Word. Christ the Eternal Word. And it starts like this. It says, In the beginning, the Word was already there. It already existed. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. Now, this is John talking about Jesus. He goes on to say, The Word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. John setting the scene for what his particular gospel was going to highlight. And each gospel had a particular aspect of Jesus that was highlighted. And John's story was highlighting Jesus as God, the I am, the revelation of God. God on earth wrapped in the limitations and the boundaries, the confinement of human flesh. All humanity and all divinity in one. And John's trying to show us what this is like. The word the word word is the word logos. And logos in the original Greek means the revelation or, or the, the declaration. And it is the declared revelation of God through humanity, which is Jesus. And it's important to remember that, that God sent us Jesus and God was Jesus and God was contained and constrained within the human limit, limitations, but fully Jesus. Now that's like this, the Bible This is God's word to us. It's his revelation to us, the logos, the the story of God. It's the words of Jesus. And 2,000 years ago, until uh, 2,000 years after Jesus, this has been compiled to represent the divine message. So it's not the paper, it's not the ink, it's not the binding, but it's the revelation. It's as good as we're going to get to Jesus in our hands. It's the confined, contained, constrained humanity presented to us as the revelation of God. And that's important to remember. And so John unpacks this further for us. So what I'm going to do this morning, I'm going to do a little bit of theology first. That's okay. Then I'm going to do a little bit of 
practical application afterwards, and then I'm going to do a little bit of spiritual impartation. Is that okay? Well, too bad if it's not because you're here and you can't leave because you're getting a present later. And the parent, Even the parents' room are laughing at that joke. So it must have hit really well. So John chapter 6. This is Jesus speaking, but remember, this is John's retelling of the story. And it's important to notice John's emphasis on the retelling of this story. This is after Jesus feeds um, the multitudes with bread and fish. And so Jesus is addressing why that happened to his disciples. He's trying to show them that, guys, it wasn't about the bread. It was about something more than that. But I'm going to show you how I'm going to use the bread to show you what matters most. So it's not about your tummy. It's about something else. And here he goes. There's John chapter 6. Because guys, I mean, 12 disciples, they would have been mostly complaining about being hungry. I mean, I'm, I'm always pretty much full all the time, but I still complain about being hungry. And so here we go. John chapter 6. He says, Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And later on in that same story, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Can you see the pattern that's emerging about the bread of life, about the logos, about the word of God being something that can sustain people and fill people and satisfy people. They can eat it and consume it and be satisfied. In verse 51 of that same chapter, it concludes like this. Jesus is speaking again. He says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I will offer so the world may live, is my flesh. So what's Jesus saying? He's saying he is the one who has come to be revealed to us so we can consume him. We can be known by him. We, he can know us. And today we get to enjoy the privilege of knowing Jesus through this divine revelation, the Bible. It's not just the pages and the ink and the binding. It's so much more than that. A.W. Tozer, he says this, a famous theologian about the Bible. He says, the Bible, this is from his book, The Pursuit of God. He says, the Bible is not an end in itself, but a means to bring people to an intimate and satisfying knowledge of God, that they may enter into him, that they may delight in his presence, that they may taste and know the inner sweetness of the very God himself in the core and centre of their hearts. So this theologian understands that the Bible meets a need that only the Bible can meet, satisfying us in the deepest place. And so as we talk about this series, Feast on This Book, it's important to picture the feast and what a feast looks like as we gather around to consume the revelation of God for his people, because he, he, he is powerful. The Bible is described as sharp, as, as sharper than a two-edged sword. It's described as powerful, transformative. And, and we're going to read it today, and I'm going to pray that reading it has a transformational impact upon your life, that the power is released through it. Uh, but I pray that it's more than just understanding and knowledge, that it becomes food for your soul. And you walk out of here satisfied that God is at work in your life. <laughs> He's doing something in you, sustaining you for what's next. I'm excited about this. But we have to consider three things that are critical before we sit down and eat this book. Are you ready for them? First thing we must consider is this, that, the, that um, a feast of the Word of God, sitting down, picture the feast, you're sitting around a table, you're feasting on the Word of God. This picture reminds us that the Bible is not a sometimes food. The Bible is not a sometimes food. In John chapter, sorry, in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, this theme of the law and the Word of God being forefront in the life of the people of God is, uh, is this declared here. As Joshua says, he hears from God. He hears these words. He says, keep this book of law always on your lips. Everybody say always. always. Everybody else who didn't say it, say it this time. Always. always. There we go. Always on your lips. In other words, be always speaking the word of God. Meditate on it in the morning and at night. So speak it out. Think about it so that you can be careful to do everything that's in it. 
and act it out. So speak it out, think about it and do it. And then you will be prosperous and successful. It's not a sometimes food. It's got to be persistent, present, prevailing in your life in every way. It's not a sometimes food. I have the confession to make today. And that is that I'm a bit of a sometimes food closet eater. And I'm sorry about that, guys. I thought, you know, I know you probably think more of me. You think better of me. But even this week, I was uh, caught myself again. I'm trying to break, I'm trying to kick it, guys. Pray for me. Uh, but... Where was I? I was driving. See, that's the trouble. You just trying to you pretend like it never happened once you've done it. You're like, no. And then if you wipe the slate clean, confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness and you can start again. Something to be said about the Catholics there. And so, no offence if you're a Catholic. We love the Catholics. And so here I have for you a little bit of sometimes food. Um, this particular dish was accompanied with a selection of Extra salted KFC fries. Oh, I've got a question for you as well after this. Not to mention a sneaky snack pack. I know what you're thinking. That's a lot of food for a little person like me. And they must have known something about me because you should have seen the amount of these little wipes they gave me. In fact, there was about 30 of these wipes in there. And I'm happy to share them with you all after the service if you want a little refresher uh, to, after you eat your Bible. But... I'm not the only one who has a penchant for takeaway because in the main household, we have rivaling clans. We have the KFC clan and we have the McDonald's clan. Now, here's the question for you. Which, or large chips, correct, small, what was this? Correct, well done. Ten points to Sam. (laughs) Now... Straw poll, guys, to settle an argument in the main household. Who prefers, likes, KFC? Over Macca's. KFC, show of hands. Oh, it's a, strong, it's a strong contingent. And you can't not vote. You can't say, oh, no, I don't eat fast food, guys. I don't touch this stuff. <laughs> what, are you, what is this? What are these containers you have in front of me? Are these from Mars? I've never... What are you talking about? So, oh, so you have to vote. KFC? Yep, got a good strong... McDonald's? Oh, wow. That's it, McDonald's. You are the losers. Sorry, guys. KFC wins the day again. Now, I I have these here for us to continue to remember the difference between feasting and sometimes food. Because feasting around a table is very different than a midnight snack. It's very different than an ice cream binge. Again, guilty. It's very different to a Macca's run or a KFC run. It's... It's regular, feasting around the table, feasting on the Word of God. It should be regular, habitual, meaningful, thoughtful, all the things that these are not, (laughs) thoughtful, meaningful, and it should be spiritually engaging in a deep way. Charles Spurgeon, famous uh, 19th century preacher, said that a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. A Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to a person who isn't. This fast food frenzy is no substitute for a deep relationship with a feast, feasting on the Word of God. But here we go. A few hot tips for us to know how to feast well on this book. And let's go through this quickly. Are you ready for these? Number one, you must slow down. There's a reason this is called fast food. To feast on the Word of God, we have to slow down. We have to prepare our heart. It can't be something that's last minute. Stir up a hunger. Stir up an appetite. Build anticipation as you begin to feast on this book. Come to the Bible with an open mind. Come on, who knows what God might want to say to me today? Something might just shift in my life as I read these words. They're more than just ink on a page. This is God's word to me. Something could shift. Something could change. God could reveal something to me. God could convict me about something in my life that I need to address. I'm coming to the word of God with an open mind. Number three, four, uh, have accompaniments and side dishes. 
Now, when I say accompaniments and side dishes with a feast, we know we go to a feast, there's gravy and there's potato and there's baked vegetables, there's boiled vegetables, and there's all the accompaniments and side dishes. And so when we feast on the Word of God, come with some side dishes, some, some study guides maybe, or, or some commentaries about what other people have thought about the thing that you are reading, or, or, or books that build your love for the Word of God accompaniment, side dishes. And finally, don't just sit down and feast once, but feast often. Now, I grew up with a single mum, and in our house, when it was just us two, it was a little bit strange to gather a feast and sit together around a table. You can't really sit around a table with two people. You can sit across from a table. You can't really sit around a table. So we did sit a lot of the time together, next to each other, maybe watching the TV. <laughs> and so when uh, I got married and we had all these children, I had to do the work of building a discipline into my life and into our family where we gathered around a table, where we got the kids together, mum and dad, we prepared the meal, we stirred the appetite, we focused on something valuable, important, we gathered together and we ate around the table. And it wasn't easy to build that discipline into our family. It took patience, intentionality, discipline, perseverance. But what at first seemed difficult to sustain, it can get to the point, if you stick with it, that it builds its own momentum. And, and now sometimes I'm the one who wants to go and watch the TV and we'll serve out the dishes and the kids will come and grab the food and walk and sit at the table. And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, well, no TV tonight. <laughs> Better sit around the table again. It begins to build its own momentum. So now gathering and feasting together regularly, it's not just a habit. It's preferred over the grab and go. It's preferred. Sometimes you get to a point where feasting on the Word of God well becomes your preference over quick fix grab and go kind of relationship with God. So number one, to feast well, the Bible is not a sometimes food. Number two, feasting well, feasting on this book, the picture of feasting reminds us that the Bible is also not a TV dinner. The Word of God, the Word of God will only satisfy, only satiate our hunger for God when it is a shared meal in community, when it is a shared meal in community. See, Uber Eats in front of the TV, which is a burgeoning market in Cessna, by the way, if you're ever thinking about starting a business, you could probably jump on there and you never know, you could capitalise on the market. It's very hard to get a delivery. <laughs> dash, door dash, Uber Eats, whatever they're called. So it's the, it's the antithesis the, of the analogy of feasting on God's word in a healthy way. And it's not about what you eat. See, see, the TV dinner analogy, it's not about what you order in. So even if you order in good stuff, good veggies, and you, know, you order in the lasagna from the fancy Italian restaurant or whatever it is, you order it in, it's the fact that you order it in and you sit down on your own in front of the TV and consume it all by yourself. It's about consuming it all by yourself. Because here's the danger of being one who doesn't feast on this, gathered around a communal table of people, one who feasts on this only on their own, this is what can happen in Proverbs 18, verse 1 to 2. It says this, one of my favourite verses actually in the whole Bible. It just keeps jumping out at me every time I read it, particularly in the New King James Version. It says this, A man who isolates himself, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. is a huge danger in only ever consuming this on your own. Now, again, I said before, I've been a Christian for nearly my whole life. I've been pastoring like this for 10 years, but I've been in church you know, leadership context for 25 years. And I can tell you, within five minutes of having a conversation with just about anybody who says they're a Christian, I can tell you whether or not they read this on their own or in community. <laughs> Don't worry, it's not you. <laughs> See, 1 Corinthians uh, 1 verse 10, Paul knew this. 
when he said to the church, he said, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, he says, by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. In thought and purpose. Now, this isn't that we all should be the same, look the same, wear the same. It's not about uniformity. It's about unity. And we only come together, unified in thought and purpose, when we are together like this. And so it's so important that when we read this, consume this, study this, feast on this, that we bring what God's put on our heart and our life and revealed to us and our knowledge to each other. And sometimes we get it wrong. And sometimes what we read, we think, oh God, I just I love what you're saying here about this verse in you know, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Finally, we can get all the women to sit on the left and all the men on the right. That's exactly what I thought you'd been saying to me all these years. You come to church, guys, God said we all should split up, men on the left, women on the right. And the rest of the church goes, guys, guys, that's not how we read that, that text. That's not in context. Let's, let's go back together and have a look at what this actually means. Let's be unified in thought and purpose instead of just going off on our own with our own ideas, our own revelations. In fact, when I was at school, high school, uh, I, I don't know why I attracted all these strange people. And even the teachers would come up to me, strange teachers. And I was in year 11, I think, 1997, 98, maybe 98, maybe, maybe year 12. And this particular teacher came up to me. And uh, I mean, I was a strong Christian at the time. I was a school captain. And, you know, I was obviously kind of a little bit unusually out there about my faith. And he came up to me and he had this, he said, oh, Luke, have you heard you know, what's going to happen in, you know, 2000? Like in a couple of years' time. I was like, oh, what? So he gets this paper and he unfurls this like scroll. Like it wasn't a scroll, but it was a, like, a, like A4 pages all stuck together with C tape. He said, oh, come and have a look at this. And he lays it all out. He goes, like 2,000 years ago, you know, like, you know, as, as um, you know, when Jesus came, 2,000 years before that, you know, they put the Torah together in the Pentateuch. And you can look at the dates and they line up here and there. And it comes to here and it's Jesus was born. It wasn't on zero. It was on the year three. And so as we come forward another 100 years and 500 years, and now that's the year 1999, he had all these pictures, drawings, angels' wings and flames. And he had these chariots and, and lions' faces and turtles' feet. And he goes, right, he's here. And he says, Do you, so in next year, Jesus is coming back. It's a teacher at my school. Who, what is that about? Anyway, what am I saying that for? Oh, Uber Eats. He was delivering it in. I don't know where he's getting it from. YouTube, that wasn't a thing back then. Facebook, Instagram. I mean, I don't hate to see what's going on in his life today, but in community, in community, someone could have said, appreciate your thoughts. Maybe not share that with the high school kids at your school. You know, there's some things that you could need, need to work on. Anyway, it's 2024. We're still here. But 2025, I have actually heard on YouTube. <laughs> no, just joking. Come on, team. Come up. Come up. So we're going to wrap it up with this final thought. Number one, feasting around the table. Yeah, nothing in there, mate. It's all good. You can have a, you can have a wipe, though. I've got, about a, I've got 500 of these. Feasting around the table reminds us that the Bible isn't a sometimes food. It can't be a TV dinner. And finally, it reminds us that we are what we eat. The Bible has the potential, as I've already said, to change us deeply, to change us from the inside out if we let it, if we let it. And that's, that's really the crux right there, if we let it. Because the Word of God, because it's so powerful, because it has so much potential to change lives, if we're honest, we can sometimes be a little too careful with how much of our lives we're willing to have exposed to the power that's contained within these words. Now, I've heard it said that when we feast on the Word of God well, we find that we aren't really reading the Bible, but it's reading us. That, that Jesus is studying us. That Jesus is, is coming alive in us. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, changing us, challenging us, convicting us and dealing with our stuff that needs to be dealt with. And in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 12, the author of this text knew this well. He said, For we have the living Word of God, which is full of energy, like a two-mouthed sword. It will even penetrate to the very core of our being, where soul and spirit, bone and marrow meet. It interprets and reveals. This is, this is the challenge. Yeah, hold on to your seats for this one. It interprets, yes, and reveals whoo, the true thoughts and secret motives of our hearts. Now, come on, who wants our secrets to be laid bare? I'm not sure I'm ready for that. 
but, 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 but be willing to open, it, open your heart up to the Word of God and, and letting the Spirit of God deal with your stuff, exposing the things in you that aren't of God will totally, totally transform you, your life, your family, your friendships, your workplace, your business. In James chapter 1, verse 22, very familiar verse about what it is to read and ignore what the Bible is saying to us. It says, don't fool yourself into thinking that you are a listener when you are anything but. Letting the Word, the Logos, go in one ear and out the other. What does he say? He says, act on what you hear. <clears throat> those who hear and don't act are like those who glance in a mirror and walk away. Two minutes later, have no idea who they are and what they look like. My heart is that you would discover who you really are through the eyes of God as you read this word, that you'd be okay with staring yourself in the face, looking, staring your fears down, you know, turning around and staring down the bear that's chasing you down and say, I'm ready to embrace the challenge that's coming my way as I read this over this next season because we're going to do it together, church. We're going to spend some time in the Word of God. And it's not just about knowing more. It's about being transformed by the power of God that's alive here in this text. And so today we can begin this transformation by inviting the Word, the Logos, Jesus into our lives, either for the first time or for the first time in a long time. And then just begin to be stirred, have an appetite for the things of God stirring you again. So why don't you close your eyes and bow your heads as I put away these moist towelettes <clears throat> and we begin to just seek God for what He wants to do with us in this moment. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Presence of God, we just invite you right now just to begin to deal with us and stir us and open our hearts to what you want to say to us. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us through Jesus and we have your word to continue to challenge us and speak to us, move us, reveal yourself to us afresh every single time we engage. I pray that as we feast on this in this next season, that you'd begin to do things in us that only you can do. Breathe life afresh and reveal light in the darkness and just help us to be transformed more into your likeness. If you're in the room this morning and you want to say yes to Jesus, you want to invite the life of Jesus into your life, if you want to have new life in Him, if you want to be restored, if you want to find redemption, then this is your moment. With every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Why don't you be a bold, um, take a bold step, raise your hand and say, Luke, oh, it's me. I want to be included in this decision moment of saying yes to Jesus for the first time. Be bold, be brave. Say, Luke, include me in this prayer as we embark upon this journey of feasting on the Word of God. Our first step is to invite Jesus, the living Word, into our life today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for what you're doing. For those of us who have a relationship with Jesus, I, I really do pray that this season of, of embarking upon feasting on the Word of God would really stir us up. And I just want to pray over us right now to set us up for, this, uh, for these next few weeks together. Lord God, I just thank you for what you're doing in this moment. Lord God, I thank you for the revelation that you've given us through your Word. I pray today that this would mark a new beginning in how we approach your Word and we would get ready for it to change our lives forever. Lord God, I pray for open hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.